Hello everybody. Do you have an idea for a true crime podcast? I publish true crime podcasts at my YouTube channel, Leader One Studios. I currently have 23,000 subscribers who are always looking for new true crime podcasts to listen to. This is an opportunity to build an audience quickly. If you're interested in joining the Leader One Podcast Network, send an email to morgansvariety at gmail.com and we can discuss the details. Hello everybody. Gratitude to everybody for listening and additional heaps of gratitude to everybody who donates to the Patreon account. You keep the show going with your donations. As I keep the expenses paid, the more content I can create. You can donate at www.patreon.com slash leader one. Or, if you'd like to make a one-time donation, you can send one through PayPal at morganrector331 at hotmail.com. Remember, there is no minimum donation, no maximum donation. If $1 a month is all you feel like you can manage, especially in these difficult times, it's still appreciated. Thank you for everything and enjoy the show. Welcome to Human Monsters. Ronald Jean Simmons was born on July 15, 1940, in Chicago, Illinois. His parents were Loretta and William Simmons. William died of a stroke on January 31, 1943. In less than a year, his mother remarried, becoming the wife of another man named William, that being William D. Griffin, who was a civil engineer for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The Corps moved the family to Little Rock, Arkansas in 1946. They were transferred to other locations in Arkansas throughout the subsequent ten years. The pattern of relentless deracination unsettled young Ronald, and he began to act out at school. Due to being a bully and overall troublemaker, he acquired a reputation for both. He struggled academically and took out his frustrations on his classmates, often with little to no provocation. At the age of 16, the school at which he was enrolled decided he was too much of a disruption to keep in the classroom. They tried every disciplinary measure at their disposal, but it was like trying to tame a wild tiger. Desperate to straighten Ronald out, his parents tried the last resort of shipping him off to military school. They hoped the drill instructors might crush him into a compliant and respectable human being. To his parents' astonishment and relief, Ronald thrived in military school. While many of his classmates withered under the harsh words and relentless pressure, Ronald rose to the occasion. He discovered a source of inner peace and purpose. After all, his entire life had been marred by constant moving, which brought chaos and uncertainty into his life. Life at the military school was consistent. He knew what to anticipate every day. That is exactly what he had been craving for years. Children need stability, and what had eluded him all his life was now instituted at the administrative level where he was living and studying. Ronald's aggressive tendencies were converted into a drive to achieve goals of a constructive nature. Though the school made the rules, as long as he obeyed, he could control his experience when it came to his conduct's reception by drill instructors, teachers, and other staff. Ronald Simmons enjoyed the military life so much that after his time at the military academy ended, he was unwilling to return to civilian life. 
He especially didn't want to move in with his family and move every few months. He wanted to maintain a life of order and structure. At the age of 17, he enlisted in the Navy. Ronald was first posted at Bremerton Naval Base in Washington. During his time there, he met a young woman named Bursabi Rebecca Ulibarri, more commonly known as Becky. She was the envy of many local girls because of her beauty. Feeling confident due to the discipline of military life and his many accomplishments, he approached her, and he was charismatic and charming enough to win her over. Eventually, they moved in together. They moved to New Mexico when Ronald was redeployed. There, they married a few days before Ronald turned 20. Ronald had been controlling before they married. The perfectionist standards of military life influenced Ronald to such a degree that he insisted his home be tidy and sparkling clean. Becky was a submissive wife who was eager to please. She also feared Ronald's reactions to any failure to keep house to his satisfaction. Now his controlling behavior expanded beyond the domain of housekeeping. He would dictate what clothing she could wear and the way she wore her hair. He had already told her to stop wearing makeup, insisting it was redundant for a woman of considerable natural beauty. He began to restrict the time she spent with friends. Becky was still in her prime, and Ronald could not abide the possibility of other men noticing her out in public and making a pass at her. His childhood was chocked full of broken friendships, and he couldn't bear to see this relationship fall by the wayside. He had a fear of abandonment, though he was careful to keep the fear factor hidden. It manifested more often as anger and domineering behavior. After a long and carefully executed campaign of verbal abuse and criticisms, he diminished Becky's self-esteem. This made her even easier to control. He brought her to the point where she came to believe that she was helpless without him. Ronald even went as far as to sever all her ties to her family. He opened all her mail, and all personal correspondences were either diverted to the trash or answered in the most perfunctory and obligatory manner possible. The number one tool used by abusive people is isolation, and by curtailing Becky's contact to the outside world, she was much less likely to abandon him. Everything in her life was custom-tailored to please Ronald. He told her that their lives were structured that way because she was too incompetent to manage things on her own. As Eleanor Roosevelt once said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Becky allowed herself to feel like a second-class citizen within the shadow of Ronald Simmons. It didn't help that one of her functions in his life was to become a verbal punching bag whenever he was in a foul mood. A year after they married, the couple's first child was born, Ronald Gene Simmons Jr. Later he would go by Gene. Two years later they had a second child who was named Sheila Marie Simmons. She quickly became Ronald's favorite. Ronald was discharged from the Navy. His controlling and abusive behavior on the domestic front worsened. This behavior subsided a couple years later when he enlisted in the Air Force. Ultimately, a lack of structure always brought out the worst in Ronald Gene Simmons. Ronald's behavior around the house was not as abusive in those days. This time around, he was more of a benevolent dictator though he still monitored Becky like a drill instructor as she cleaned and refused to allow her to venture out in public unaccompanied. She still did not protest, deciding it was a better option to do Ronald's bidding than to face the outside world as a single mother, something for which she felt she was too unprepared. Throughout the subsequent years, Ronald and Becky had five more children, William, Loretta, Eddie, Marianne, and Rebecca Lynn. All the Simmons children were assigned chores and a position within the household's hierarchy. Their house almost functioned like a military operation. 
rejecting free-form living as always, Ronald was not prepared to accept it from his children. He decided early on that any child that would not comply with his orders would be thrown out. Their chores were far more demanding than cleaning their rooms or helping with the dishes. Their father would interpret the failure to do a chore and to do it properly as an act of disloyalty, and he always took it personally. Anybody who wished to dwell under his roof was forced to accept his control. Sheila was still Ronald's favorite. He spent most of his free time with her. By the time she turned 13, the affection he showed toward her stood out in a big way. After all, he had never shown this kind of love to his other kids. Even his wife was sidelined. He felt Sheila was a kindred spirit. Any special treats or favors he doled out as a father were only received by Sheila. In fact, Speculation had it that Sheila was the only person Ronald had ever loved. Though he was normally reluctant to visit family, he was unable to avoid taking his family to visit his sister-in-law one Christmas. Sheila was about 15 years old. When Becky's sister observed the ways in which Ronald and Sheila related to each other, she was disturbed. One such example of this behavior was when Sheila went over to where Ronald was scowling, alone, and stretched out over his lap, as a toddler would. If this was not enough to bring him out of his funk, she would kiss him on the cheek. Becky and the rest of their children didn't bat an eyelash. They were used to seeing that kind of display. To outsiders, it was abnormal. There was something coquettish in Sheila's approach to Ronald, that didn't sit right with him. 1979. Ronald Gene Simmons retired from the military at the rank of Master Sergeant after a career spanning 22 years. He was respected and decorated, having received a Bronze Star, the Republic of Vietnam Cross, and the Air Force Ribbon. He was noted for his exceptional marksmanship, especially when it came to the 22 caliber pistol, which was his firearm of choice. Ronald's disposition was never eagerly awaited when he left the service, but this time around it was different. He wasn't as abusive and controlling. Things did change, however. One day when the family headed out to the grocery store, Becky walked around to the passenger side door, her usual position in the vehicle as the family's matriarch. When she opened the door, she saw that Sheila was riding shotgun. She was buckled and ready to go. Ronald had been smiling about teasing Sheila. When he saw Becky, the smile dropped. He nodded toward the back seat. Becky had just received a downgrade in their domestic hierarchy. She got into the back seat with nary a verbalized complaint. She felt shame as they pulled out of the driveway. She also felt betrayed by Sheila. The unfairness of it all didn't appear in Sheila's radar. After all those years, Becky still could not deliver the perfection Ronald expected of her. He still directed and criticized her every move. She contemplated this as she looked toward the front of the car, where Ronald and Sheila were holding hands. It seemed like they were in love. Jealousy plunged its dagger in Becky's heart, and the blade was twisted as their neighbors saw them driving by. It was humiliating. All those years of hard work and childbirth, and she was usurped not only by a teenager, but her own daughter. When they arrived at the store, Ronald and Sheila were still so lost in conversation, there was no sign that they were going to leave the car. At some point, Ronald's brow furrowed, and he said to Becky, Go on, then. We'll be waiting for you. Becky felt rejected by both of them. As she walked toward the supermarket, she turned back just in time to see Sheila lean over to Ronald and kiss him on the mouth. It was a lengthy kiss, maintained long enough that there was no sign they would break free from it when Becky turned her attention back to the store. One day, Ronald called the family into a room for a meeting. 
The agenda was to clarify for them the nature of his relationship with Sheila. She was now 17 years old and pregnant with his child. He decided she would bring the child to term, and it would be raised with the rest of the family. He had every intention to continue his incestuous relationship with his daughter and expected the rest of the family to accept, accommodate, and support the arrangement. Becky did not protest. Ronald had broken her down too much to make that possible. Inwardly, she was disgusted and ashamed, but she kept it to herself. Instead of reporting it to the authorities for the good of her daughter, she rolled over and played dead. Not everybody was willing to accept this. Ronald Jr., or Gene, had observed helplessly as his father abused his mother his entire life, and he was sick of it. He wasn't exactly thrilled to receive much of the same treatment while knowing Sheila was the only child his father ever loved. He knew there was no point in reporting it to the police because Sheila was in love with her father and could easily deny that anything untoward was going on. He took a different tack. He reported the pregnancy to her school's counselor. Meetings were held at Sheila's school. At first, she denied that she was pregnant. When she failed to convince the counselor of this, she was pressed for information about the father. She was over the age of consent in New Mexico and had never had a boyfriend, so red flags abounded. After nearly a month of these meetings, she broke down and confessed that her father got her pregnant. Ronald was slapped with the customary charges, but Sheila refused to testify about the truth of her child's paternity. Her reasons remain unknown, but what is known was that Ronald became very emotionally abusive toward her at that time. He blamed her for bringing shame on the family name and undermining the happiness they found as a couple. From a letter he wrote to her at that time, You have destroyed me, and you have destroyed my trust in you. I will see you in hell. The fallout from this event was swift and destructive to the family. For the first time in years, Becky tried to leave Ronald. The family's reputation was sullied by deviant sexual behavior, and she was anxious to escape the effects of the stigma. She faced this with more trepidation than Ronald's abuse. Gene had had his fill of his dysfunctional family and its controlling, abusive, and perverted patriarch, and he moved out. Despite Sheila's refusal to identify her father as the biological father of her child, the legal system of New Mexico was still processing charges of incest against Ronald. Though he normally rejected instability in all its forms, he could not bear to face prosecution for having sex with his daughter. He relocated what remained of the family to another state without notifying outsiders. A year later, the investigation into Ronald Gene Simmons and his incestuous rape of his daughter drew to a standstill due to the absence of both the victim and the perpetrator. The case went cold. This was a common occurrence at the time, as states were ill-equipped to pursue offenders who had moved to other states. The Simmons family relocated to Ward, Arkansas. They were a reclusive clan, venturing into the outside world only when it was unavoidable. They changed residences on a regular basis. It was exactly the kind of life Ronald hated, but he earned it. The rootlessness of it drove him to rages, and he became more abusive to his family than he had been in years. After constant relocation within the state, the family finally settled in Mockingbird Hill, Arkansas. This was a romantic name for what was essentially an abandoned country lot. There were dozens of no trespassing signs posted along the path that led them to the house. Their so-called house consisted of two trailers that were welded together as one structure. 
perfect for a man who is eager to avoid attracting attention for having sex with his daughter. Despite finding this as their resting place, the relations among the Simmons family were tense. Many of the older children began to rebel against Ronald. Ultimately, the hatred of being constantly relocated was hereditary. Even Sheila grew disenchanted with her father. Naturally, this situation was one Ronald could not abide. He decided it was high time to tighten his grip on them. Becky's parenting standard deteriorated because of Ronald's domineering behavior. He would not allow the children to cry for any reason, so when she heard one of the children cry, she didn't act. It seemed like the best she could do as a mother at that time, and in that circumstance, even if her conduct as a parent would not have been considered appropriate by the lights of conventional society. What was more important to Ronald was that the children be put to work. They built a large cinder block wall around the property to ensure that outsiders would never ascertain how this grotesquely dysfunctional family functioned. Children resided in neighboring properties, but the Simmons kids were not allowed to socialize with or even meet them. Barbed wire was to be installed at the top of the wall. Working on the wall left the children with sore muscles, damaged joints, bleeding hands, and other injuries. Little Becky, at eight years old, suffered the worst of the injuries. Barbara hid out in her room, feeling that if her father was unaware of her presence, she wouldn't have to work. For the most part, the plan worked. The children even dug a cesspit, since the house didn't have operational plumbing. The pension Ronald received from the military only covered rent and bills. He was forced to come out of retirement and work a regular job like the average American for whose freedom he fought. The only jobs he could find were available in Russellville, which was 35 miles away. After being respected and rewarded for his work with medals, it was very hard for Ronald to find himself in the position where he was disrespected by employers, colleagues, and the public. He had laid his life on the line for them, but now they saw him as inferior, a serf. Not only was this hard to accept as a veteran, but given that he had an ego of gargantuan dimensions, it was injurious to his pride, and vendettas sprouted in clusters in his mind, like mold spores. It was another situation that existed beyond his ability to exert control, and it was unacceptable to him. He didn't find it difficult to accept that he was answerable to others in the military, but that was because the senior officers were more experienced and highly trained. In his post-retirement work, any Karen off the street was free to berate him, and it was hard for him to tolerate. The position he secured was as a clerk in a law firm. His self-discipline and strong work ethic served him and his employers effectively, and his output was well received. It was going well until he made some inappropriate comments of a sexual nature to a female co-worker. She reported this to management, and he was promptly terminated. Ronald always felt he was entitled to the attentions and sexual reciprocity of women, as if they were merchandise that were rightfully his to exploit and use as objects. Rejection was unthinkable and unjustifiable as far as he was concerned, and this rejection sent him into a rage. Ronald turned to Becky for sexual gratification, though it was more likely that she was just a plaything than anything else. She was just a medium for release. It was purely transactional, and she knew she was being used. He had become temperamental since losing his job, and she was tired of being a punching bag. She set her sights on leaving. Ultimately, she would return, concerned about the fate that might befall her children in her absence. He had already sexually abused and impregnated one daughter. There were more where she came from. Ronald got another job, this time at an oil company. Though the company was aware of his sexual harassment incident, they were willing to overlook it because they were so impressed with his work record. 
The honeymoon was short-lived. He was insubordinate and disputatious with management. He also hadn't learned his lesson about intersexual relations in the workplace. He conducted himself in a lewd manner with a female colleague, and he was soon fired. During his time of employment, his children began to socialize with their age-appropriate contemporaries. They didn't dare bring anybody home, but they were happy to make friends and begin dating. Ronald was hired by the Woodline Motor Freight Company. This time, he resolved to keep his interactions with female co-workers strictly platonic and professional. Nevertheless, he still secretly had little but contempt for women. He also strongly disliked civilian authority. Bearing this in mind, one can't help but surmise that he wasn't exactly thrilled by having a female boss, that being Joyce Elaine Butts. The two crossed swords on many occasions. While he found it difficult to accept a woman in a position of authority over him, she found it difficult to accept that an employee seemed to go out of his way to ignore her orders. He frequently went above her head to meet with the owner of the company to arrange for an arbitration, which further aggravated Butts. When Joyce Butts discovered he had been contacting one of his female colleagues from his former place of employment under the ruse of making amends, she had had her fill of Ronald Simmons and dismissed him. It hadn't occurred to Ronald that getting fired had anything to do with his unprofessional conduct and insubordination. The way he saw it, the women of Arkansas were conspiring against him, and it was costing him his right to earn a living. At one time, the thought of working as a convenience store clerk would have been unthinkable to Simmons. Nevertheless, he was hired to work as a counter jockey, and though the pay was meager compared to that of his other jobs, he at least didn't have to work for a woman. There were other veterans working for the business, and he was pleased to interact with them. Eventually, he soured on his employment situation. He hated customer service, and the pay was just enough to stave off the threat of starvation. One co-worker remembered him as angry and gruff, though he noted that he participated in a Christmas drive to provide presents to children of indigent families. Rumors abounded about town that Becky was unfaithful to Ronald. This was baffling to him. He felt like he did everything to give her a better life. He saw this as a mortifying betrayal, even after choosing his own daughter over his wife and getting her pregnant. He wanted blood, Becky's blood. He didn't just want to hurt her. He wanted to erase her unwholesome influence from the face of the earth. As soon as the evidence emerged, he would prosecute her to the fullest extent of the Ronald Gene Simmons criminal code. While listening to a gospel program on the radio, he fancied himself a modern-day Job, suffering the tortures of a vengeful God to test his faith. In his mind, Becky was Lilith. She needed to suffer the wrath of a vengeful God. Ronald was happy to persecute her on his deity's behalf. When Ronald arrived home, he was outraged to find that a gate in the driveway was left opened. It could only mean one thing. A stranger was visiting. Police? A social worker? Friends of the children? A boyfriend or girlfriend of one of his children? Whether they were any of those possibilities or another, he was not at all pleased by the visit. When he drove up to the house, there was a new car parked out in front that he didn't recognize. When he entered the house, he encountered a young man he had never met. There was tension in the silent room. It grew as Ronald entered the room. Becky was there, but the kids had been ushered into their bedrooms. The boy looked to be about Sheila's age. He was from the area. Ronald wondered why Sheila wasn't there. The boy got up from a chair and extended his hand to Ronald. Ronald smiled tightly and said, Pleasure to meet you, son. The boy returned the smile and said, It is good to meet you, sir. My name is Dennis McNulty, 
and I wonder if I could trouble you and your wife for a few minutes to discuss some important matters. After getting himself a beer, Ronald sat down on a sofa across from Dennis. He wasn't as pleasant this time around. He said, What do you want, boy? Dennis said, Right to the point. I like that. Well, Mr. Simmons, I have intentions to ask your daughter to marry me. Already sort of did, if the truth be told. But I wanted to speak to you about a few things before that went any further. Ronald was overwhelmed at what he perceived to be a betrayal on Sheila's part. He said, Sheila, he trailed off. Contemplating this more deeply, he said, Son, I love my daughter dearly, and I'm sure that she has been whispering all sorts of sweet nothings in your ears. But I don't think that you want to spend the rest of your life raising some other man's bastard, do you? Dennis said, With all due respect, sir, I love your daughter, and I have spent some time with little Sylvia, too. I would be happy to call that little girl my daughter and raise her as my own. Ain't you a little bit too young to be making big decisions like this? A child is a big responsibility. It ain't like a pet dog. I would take my responsibilities very seriously, sir. I would take good care of your daughter and I would never abuse the trust that Sheila has put in me. I'm not sure what you were getting at here, son, so let me cut to the chase. There ain't no way that I am letting you walk out of here with my daughter and that baby. Not tonight. Not ever. Dennis wasn't swayed. Still smiling, he said, Sheila is already gone. Her and Sylvia were gone before you even arrived. They were in my apartment right now, getting themselves settled in. If it was up to her, we would have just up and left without ever saying a word to you. But I believe in doing things right. I believe in talking straight with people. And I hope that they will do the same with me. Ronald jumped out of his seat and rushed halfway across the floor. He stopped upon Dennis's next announcement. Sheila told me all about you, Mr. Simmons. She told me all about who her baby's daddy is. Like I said, I like honesty. Ronald was bursting with rage. He was clenching his fists, just one step away from unleashing fury on Dennis's face. Dennis was not intimidated. He had more for Ronald. She told me exactly what you did to her, sir. I know everything. That is why I wanted to speak to you tonight instead of just vanishing like a coward. So that you would know what I know, and so that I could tell you this. They were standing nose to nose now. Ronald was shaking with anger. Dennis was unstoppable. He put a cap on it. If you ever come near her or Sylvia again, if you lay a finger on either one of them, from now until the end of your miserable life. I will kill you. So help me God, I will kill you, sir. Dennis nodded curtly and departed. Becky and the children were surprised by Ronald's reaction to losing Sheila. Instead of raging at them and subjecting them to abuse, he drank several beers every night after work and retired to his bedroom early. He didn't speak to them much and demanded little from them. It was a culture shock after so many years of having their father dictate their every move. The children were more socially active than ever. Becky resumed her communication with her relatives by mail. She struggled to come up with an exit strategy that would not only end with her landing on her feet, but would not involve placing a burden on her children for support. She decided to spend one last Christmas with them before leaving. She wrote the following letter to be received by the children after her departure. Dear Bill, Renata, and Trey, Loretta, Maybe staying in town Friday night, so I'll have her mail this. I've been thinking of all you said, Bill, and I know you are right. I don't want to live the rest of my life with Dad, but I'm still trying to figure out how to start. 
What if I couldn't find a job for some time? You have to remember, I've never had a job since I've been married, or before that either. I know I have to start somewhere. It would all be so much easier if it was just me. But I have three kids also by then. So if you want to do any checking by telephone, go ahead and check and we can talk about it when you come. I've decided if I borrow from mom that I would have her send it to you. I'm still all very confused. But like I said, I do know I don't want to stay with dad but don't want him getting any more than he deserves. Yet sometimes I feel God is telling me to be more patient. Right now, I'll just say, do some checking, and then it will help me make my decision. I would like for Loretta to move with you after she turns 18. She wants to go to college, and she can get a job too. I don't think San Antonio is the place for her. Little Jean and Wilma are back together, but they want to try it out and try to come get Barbara. I'm sure enjoying Barbara. She's a sweet, lovable, polite little girl. She is a good girl, and we all love her and enjoy her so much. She always has us laughing. And I'm so proud of Trey. The last time you came, Dad wanted to know how come you didn't stay long enough to see him, too. Now that L. Jean and Wilma are back together, I wish they could move from San Antonio. Barbara needs both her parents. They both been through so much, I hope it works out. I love them both. Wilma wrote me a letter telling me she loves L. Jean very much. And she must. She went back to him. And I'm sure she has been hurt deeply. I want to see all of my children happy. I've remembered a lot what you said, Bill. I am a prisoner here, and the kids too. I know when I get out, I might need help. Dad has had me like a prisoner. That freedom might be hard for me to take. Yet I know it would be great. Having my children visit me anytime. Having a telephone. Going shopping if I want. Even going to church. Every time I think of freedom, I want out as soon as possible. I don't want to put any burden on my children, and I think it's best while, or before I get out, I'd be too old. I want out, but it's the beginning. Once I get a job and place that I can handle it, with the mental support of my children, I can do it. It was hard to talk in front of L. Jean. He had been having it so hard, and his problems were deeply in my mind. I felt sorry for him. I was so afraid of what he might go back and do. You are lucky, Bill. You have a very good wife. She had led you the right way, and that is toward God. She is very pretty, too. I have always thanked God for sending you a good wife. I'm thankful for Dennis, too. Give my darling Trey a lot of hugs and kisses for me. I love you all very much. Barbara gets bored if I take too long to write, so I hope I made sense in this letter. Hope Loretta can mail this Friday or Saturday on her way home. Love you very much, Mom. A few weeks later, Ronald resigned from his position at the convenience store. He didn't quit in a rage after an encounter with a Karen. He was just discouraged and disillusioned with life. Getting up to do that hateful job every day was more than he could manage. Becky had seen to it that everybody would enjoy Christmas. Even Sheila and Sylvia were due to pay a visit, albeit in the company of Dennis. His daughter and wife had slipped out of his hands. Becky didn't leave the house She just moved out of the master bedroom. He spent nearly all his time at home drinking. He mostly just left to buy more alcohol. His room was cluttered and filthy now that Becky refused to clean it. Life was looking lonely and bleak during the season of cheer and goodwill toward men. This turn of events had changed the trajectory of his life. But he had plans. Nobody would keep Ronald Gene Simmons down for long. 
as his first excursion into the outside world in a long time, Ronald drove to Walmart. He took with him money that was supposed to keep the family afloat until he got a new job. He spent the money not on groceries, but on a brand new 22 caliber pistol and a box of ammunition. Outside the house, Ronald took up a crowbar from his tool kit. He was burning with wrath while thinking of Becky. She had undermined his efforts to ensure they lived in a clean and uncluttered house with children who were disciplined and in whom they were to instill a respectable work ethic. Now all that had fallen by the wayside, and not only did Ronald feel disappointment, but he felt betrayed. He saw his domination of the household as beneficial for all, and now, as he saw it, Becky had ruined it. Gene Jr. backed out of little Becky's room. Ronald despised Gene Jr. He always saw him as troublesome. He felt that his mother became more difficult after his birth. Gene Jr. intuited that his father was on the warpath. He said, Dad? Ronald hit Gene in the center of his forehead with a crowbar. Gene became disoriented and staggered. Ronald whacked him with a crowbar over and over. Gene fell to the floor and hit a chair. His mouth hung open, and his eyes were unfocused, apparently as a complication of brain damage. As Gene gasped and drooled, Ronald became enraged by his weakness. He pounded the boy's face with the crowbar one more time, breaking his nose. Blood sprayed from Gene's nose as he became unconscious. Never being the type to leave anything to chance, Ronald hit Gene with maximum impact on his skull. Ronald took in the scene for a moment. Blood was gushing from Gene's nose and ears. For the first time since the first day of Gene's life, Ronald smiled in his presence. He stomped on Gene's groin to make sure he was still unresponsive. After the death rattle, Ronald was assured that Gene no longer posed a threat to his idea of order. Ronald heard Becky coming. He hid from her. When she got an eye full of the carnage, she went into shock. She was so upset she didn't see Ronald coming. Thump! Ronald swung the crowbar across her shoulders, and she fell to the floor without resistance. This wouldn't be difficult for him. The way he saw it, she ruined his life. She encouraged the children to rebel against him. He had had enough of her subversion. Becky writhed around as Ronald thwacked her with the crowbar in a frenzy. He was determined to make it hurt as much as possible. He broke her ribs. He stopped for a moment to catch his breath. He recommenced the execution, this time striking her with the teeth of the crowbar. He dislodged chunks of flesh from her body. She was bleeding profusely in the perforated spots. The bleeding spots expanded rapidly, like blooming roses in time-lapse photography. Becky was dead by the time he finished beating her. To avoid risking her survival, he shot her in the back of her head. A huge splotch of blood, flesh, and brain matter blew out the crown of her head and seeped into the carpet. The copper-like smell of blood permeated the air. Little Barbara was startled awake by the gunshot and began to cry. Ronald decided to give himself a break. He chuckled at this, seeing himself as any working man. It just so happened that his task that day was to murder his wife and family. He had a beer and admired Becky's lifeless body. Her corpse posed no opposition to his way of life, and this was just splendid as far as he was concerned. Barbara was still crying, and it became tiresome. He put down his beer and headed for her room with a gun concealed behind his back. He hid the pistol when he arrived at her bedside. He wrapped his arms around her. She felt reassured by his presence and immediately stopped crying. His hands moved up her back to her neck. He wrapped them around her throat and began to squeeze. He closed his grip as hard as he could as he choked the last gust of breath out of her. 
His fingernails pierced bleeding crescents into her flesh. Once she was limp in his arms, he let her fall to her bed like a dummy. She had urinated out of fear, and the stench wafted throughout her room. Ronald's work was far from over. He brought the corpses outside. He lifted a cinder block from one corner of the cesspit and drew the tarpaulin off. He tossed the remains of Becky and Jean into the hole. He kicked them across to the furthest side to reserve room for Barbara. He tossed the crowbar into the hole to negate the possibility of forgetting to hide it at a later time. Ronald was sickened by the idea of handling Barbara's urine-soaked dead body, so he wrapped her in a garbage bag. She was buried next to her mother. He attached some barbed wire around the perimeter of the cesspit to prevent animal predation. He doused the corpses of his wife and children with kerosene. He cleaned up the blood and gore in the house and sat in front of the television with a beer. He awaited the arrival of the rest of his children at the end of their school day. When his kids arrived at the driveway and saw their father standing there, they were shocked. He had never done this before, and they were suspicious. They were even more suspicious when he said, Christmas is coming. Your mom likes surprises. You work it out. There was something ominous about his expression of yuletide cheer. Once inside the house, Ronald led the children to their bedrooms. Addressing them individually, he said, There's a special surprise for each of you, but your mom wants to see each of you enjoy yours. So you're to come through one at a time when I come to fetch you. The children's faces lit up. It seemed to them that their father turned a new leaf. They were pleased to see the transition. Loretta was the first to receive her surprise. He took her into the living room, where the smell of blood lingered. He brought her through the sliding doors that led outside. He took her to the water barrel that was positioned at the rear side of the house. He turned to her. She was the same age as Sheila was when she betrayed him. She even resembled Sheila. He grabbed her hair and shoved her face through a layer of ice on top of the water barrel. She struggled, but Ronald's strength was unopposable for her. In desperation, she clawed at his hands. He didn't allow the girls to grow their nails long and paint them, so there was little to no damage she could do. As a response, he pushed her neck against the rim of the barrel and pressed his weight down upon it. Before long, she stopped floundering and grew still. Ronald brought Loretta's remains to the cesspit and threw her in with Becky, Barbara, and Jean. Next stop, Eddie's room. Eddie didn't fight back much. He accepted that he was called to the moment of his demise and was soon insentient. He joined his mother and siblings in the cesspit. He did the same to Mary Ann. She struck Ronald in the face with her elbow when the water touched her skin. She had enough fight in her for a man who was only drowning her in jest, but her father wasn't kidding, and soon she was dead. Little Becky was the last. She was too short to reach the top of the barrel, so he strangled her until she was so deprived of oxygen, her face turned purple and her eyes rolled up into her head. He tossed her into the cesspit with the rest of her family. Ronald poured more kerosene over the bodies. He got his good gloves and some barbed wire and laid it in layers over the corpses. Having finished with this, he rolled the tarp back over them and fixed it in place with a cinder block. The children who had moved out were due to pay a visit over the Christmas holidays. Becky, while she was still alive, had made the arrangements. Billy his wife Renata, and their son Trey. Sheila, Sylvia, Dennis, and their new child were due to make an appearance. Ronald had bottled in his rage all year, but now was about to burst forth from him. He was especially determined to retaliate against Dennis for taking Sheila. When Billy and his family arrived, 
The wife and child walked behind him. Ronald raised his gun and pointed it in Billy's direction. Billy let out a gasp. Ronald shot him in the sternum. The bullet burrowed through his heart and then rattled around before bouncing off his ribs. Billy was so stunned that he was shocked to see a growing spot of blood growing on his chest. Renata rushed forward to come to her husband's aid. Ronald shot her. Her hair was festooned with fragments of her skull and chunks of flesh and brain matter. Trey went into shock as he took in the sight of his parents' freshly killed corpses. He began to shake from terror. He wet his pants. Ronald hated it when children pissed their pants. It was an egregious inconvenience to him. After going indoors for a while, Ronald came back out. At the very sight of him, Trey became so terrified, his legs turned to jelly, and he fell to the ground. Ronald picked him up and took him to the water barrel. Ronald pushed Trey's head under water and held him there until his limbs stopped flailing. Once he went still, Ronald let him fold over. Unlike the other corpses, the bodies of Billy, Renata, and Trey were not taken to the cesspit. They were taken to the living room to be put on display. Ronald did the same with the other bodies. It was a showcase of mayhem, death, and destruction. The way he saw it, the corpses of these people who had betrayed him would serve post-mortem as his hunting trophies. He could control them now more than ever. He had overcome chaos. He waited for Sheila, Dennis, and Sylvia. They were due to arrive in about an hour. He inspected his gun to make sure it was fully loaded and completely operational. Sheila had double-crossed him more than any other. She was his girl, his one true love. She not only left him, but chose another man. Ronald didn't see himself as a pedophile, rapist, and incestuous father. He saw himself as a jilted lover. He also saw Sheila and her family as deserving of what he considered to be their just desserts. When Sheila and family arrived, there was a brief moment when Ronald was caught up in nostalgia for Sheila's childhood. Sylvia's childlike chatter reminded him of Sheila from when she was Sylvia's age. Ultimately, he was unable to forget that it was the dream that died, and Sheila had only become the woman who had broken his heart like no other. Dennis knocked on the door. Ronald shouted, Come on in, we're all waiting for you. When they walked in, Dennis held Sheila's hand as if to remind Ronald that she was his woman. Ronald hadn't seen Sheila in years, and it triggered some of the old feelings. His lip quivered. He fought back tears and won. She looked very different. She cut her hair. She was dressed like a woman, the common woman you would see about town. In other words, she had grown up. She was not his little girl. She was very much a wife, mother, and adult. She was so far beyond his control and influence, she was nearly unrecognizable. Only her face was the same. Ronald showed Dennis his plastic smile and said, Come on in, let's have a talk. When they walked in, they took a few paces before freezing at the sight of the corpses. They were neatly arranged in a row horizontally. Dennis was shaking. Ronald said to him, What do you think, boy? Do you still think you're going to kill me if I touch my own girl again? Do you think that you are anything to me except a waste of a bullet? Ronald shot Dennis in his chest. Blood sprayed at the wall behind him. It was the same shade of red as Sheila's lipstick. Ronald pointed the gun at Sheila's chest. Bellowing out between the cracks of his broken heart, he said, You have destroyed me. You have destroyed your mother, your brother, your sisters. You have destroyed all of us. You are a traitor, and I will see you in hell. He shot her, and she died from that one bullet. 
It didn't feel like enough to Ronald. As she lay lifeless on the floor, he emptied the rest of the magazine into her corpse. The blood from each wound shot upwards and blasted the walls, the Christmas tree, and her children. Ronald grabbed the son sired by Dennis and Sheila and choked him unto his death. Once he was dead, he took him outside and tossed him into a patch of mud. He spat on his remains. One last candidacy for victimhood remained. Sylvia. She was trying to shake Dennis awake. Ronald scooped her up. She cried out and struggled to break free from his arms. He strangled her as she swung at him and struggled to scream with what little air remained in her lungs. Their eyes locked as he watched the life inside of hers grow dim. Finally, they rolled up into her head. He held onto her throat long after she was dead, as if in disbelief that it was finally over. Nevertheless, it was finally over. Everyone who thought they could defy and abandon him had paid a price for it, and he felt he was vindicated. He had won the war on chaos. His victory was not heralded by the sounds of marching bands and the cheers of adoring crowds, but by the silent weeping of the deceased following the torment leading to their demise. Dennis, Sylvia, and the boy were placed next to the other corpses. Sheila was next, but he couldn't bring himself to align her with the peasantry that populated her post-mortem domain. He put her on the dining room table and covered her with Becky's finest tablecloth. She bled through the tablecloth. Ronald put her son's body in the car's trunk and left it at a spot where broken-down cars were often abandoned. He felt the boy was unworthy to decompose in the company of the rest of his family, being that he was the spawn of Dennis. When Ronald returned home, he doused the bodies with kerosene to purge the air of the smell of death in blood. He went out to a bar to celebrate what he considered to be his emancipation. No more kids. No more Becky. They couldn't betray or defy him anymore. He felt free. He laughed to himself maniacally as he replayed the murders in his head. It was disconcerting to the other patrons of the bar. Ronald's mission to avenge himself against all who had done wrong to him was not complete, however. The next day, Ronald drove into Russellville. He stopped by Walmart to replenish his supply of ammunition. From there, he drove to the offices of his former employers, the law firm of Peel, Eddie, and Gibbons. Kathy Kenrick, who got him fired for sexual harassment, was still employed there, and she had a bullet with her name on it. Ronald wore a cowboy hat as a half-assed disguise. Everybody else in the office could hear the sound of Kathy screaming, and then the gunshot. They were so stunned, they couldn't move at first. If it was real, they were surprised that the subject within the crosshairs was not an attorney. They all ducked underneath their desks. A client of the firm witnessed the incident. As he left the office, she started screaming, He shot her! He shot her! A legal secretary went in to investigate. In Kendrick's office, there was a bullet in the wall and her body was slumped on the floor. Blood seeped out from a wound in her head. She died before the ambulance arrived. Ronald was not yet identified as the perpetrator. Ronald's next stop was the Taylor Oil Company. The way he saw it, he had never done anything wrong. It was the punishments for his transgressions that were wrong, and the parties responsible were unforgivable as far as he was concerned. He wasn't as fussy when it came to victims at this location. As he saw it, anybody connected to this company was his adversary. He killed a man who was a trucker and a volunteer fireman named J.D. Chafin, simply because he walked into Ronald's line of sight at an inopportune moment. The man died before first responders arrived. Ronald's real target was Russell Rusty Taylor, who was the owner of both Taylor Oil and the Sinclair Mini Mart where Ronald had worked. 
He shot him twice, and Taylor was critically wounded. Julie Money, a new employee at the company, froze when she saw J.D. Chavin's corpse on the ground. Suddenly a revolver was placed against her forehead. She thought of her two minor-aged children. She screamed, No! She jumped for cover as he shot her. A bullet cut a path across the top of her head as she fell behind some crates. She was still alive and played dead. Satisfied that she was dead, Ronald moved on, firing bullets without a target to establish intimidation. Russell Taylor's life was saved by paramedics. Next stop, the mini-mart where he had worked. He had been belittled and insulted on the premises and was keen to get even. His former colleague, Rebecca Woolery, was working the counter. He looked her in the eye and shot her in the chest. The manager, David Salyer, heard the shot and came rushing from the back of the store. Ronald turned the gun on him. David grabbed a chair and threw it at Ronald. It knocked Ronald off balance, compromising his ability to aim. He got his bearings and shot Salyer, but though the wound knocked him to the ground, the injury was not fatal. Both David and Rebecca survived. Unbeknownst to Ronald at the time, Another former co-worker, Bill Mason, was stocking shelves out of sight. He threw numerous heavy cans at Ronald. This was enough to dispatch Ronald into retreat, and he left the store. The massacre was not over. Ronald drove to Woodline Motor Freight to find yet another woman who had wronged him. After stalking the offices, he tracked down Joyce Butts, and fired two shots at her, one in her chest and the other in her head. He smirked as he did so. She collapsed without saying anything, which pleased him to no end. Remarkably, she survived the attack. Ronald went into a computer office where he discovered one of his former colleagues, Vicki Jackson. She was crouching on the floor. He dragged her up to her feet. She was terrified fearing that it was now her turn on the slab. Ronald was surprisingly calm now. He set his gun on a table and offered Vicky his backup pistol to reinforce the fact that he meant her no harm. He told her to call the police. He said he wasn't going to hurt her. He said his killing spree was over. They spent the next few minutes making small talk. He said that he didn't want to end up in a shootout with the police for fear that it might leave him with a disability, and it occurred to him that it was one of the worst manifestations of a loss of control. He wanted to die on his own terms, and that meant retaliation against all the people who had ruined his life, as he saw it. It took investigators days to find all the bodies back at Ronald's house. Dumping kerosene on them and wrapping them in plastic created some difficulty for forensics. Little was known about the family by anyone other than Ronald Simmons since the family did not socialize with other residents of the community aside from some of the local youth. Ronald was analyzed by a psychiatrist. He was found to be fit to stand trial. Ronald Gene Simmons received a sentence of death by lethal injection for every one of his victims. Arkansas Governor and future President Bill Clinton signed Ronald Simmons' second death warrant on May 31, 1990. Ronald Gene Simmons was executed on June 25, 1990. Special thanks to Melissa Anderson for her voice work. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.